act three, scene four is a very important scene that happens here about halfway through the play. Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are holding a feast for all of the lords, all of the thanes, to come together now to that Macbeth is king. And so this is an important opportunity where Macbeth can try to prove himself to be a good king. And so it is really kind of like their first impression as king and queen. So the way that this feast goes will really kind of determine whether or not the thanes are going to support Macbeth as continuing to be the king. Before we begin the scene, I want to review irony really quickly because there are many examples of irony in this act or in this scene. And if, especially if you pay close attention to the stage directions, that's going to help you with some of these. So dramatic irony is when the audience knows something that the characters do not. They can see something or hear something or have knowledge that some of the characters do not have. Verbal irony is when the character says the opposite of what they mean. That is sometimes called sarcasm, but it is not always done with a sarcastic tone. Situational irony is when what happens is the opposite of what you expect, or it happens with an unexpected twist. We will see examples of all these types of irony in scene four. So I will be stopping this rather frequently because it is, first of all, a long scene, but there's also a lot going on that is important. So pay attention to really, there's just some ceremony at the beginning with everyone coming in and being seated. The, um, when Macbeth says, you know your own degrees, it's important to note that there was a specific way to enter a feast that those of higher degree of higher rank got to come in and sit down first before those of lower degree and then the exit took place in the opposite way so kind of like how at graduation you have to enter and exit in a specific way it was part of the ceremony and very soon after everyone enters and gets seated one of the murderers shows up at the door and calls Macbeth over to report how that went. You know your own degree, sit down. First and last, a hearty welcome. Thank you, Your Majesty. Our self will mingle with society and play the humble host. Our hostess keeps her state, but in best time we will require her welcome. <laughs> Pronounce it for me, sir. To all our friends, for my heart speaks, they are welcome. <laughs> See, they encounter thee with their hearts' thanks. Both sides are even. Here I'll sit in the midst. Ah. Be large in mirth, anon we'll drink a measure, the table round. <laughs> there is blood upon thy face. Tis bank wars then. Tis better thee without than he within. Is he dispatched? My lord, his throat is cut. That I did for him. Oh, thou art the best of the cutthroats. Yet he's good that did the like for fleance. Oh. If thou didst it, thou art the non-pareil. Most royal, sir. Fleance escaped. Then comes my fit again. I had else been perfect, whole as the marble, founded as the rock, as broad and general as the casing air. But now I am cabined, cribbed, confined, bound in to saucy doubts and fears. But Banquo's safe. Aye, my good lord. Safe in a ditch, he bides with twenty trenchant gashes on his head, the least a death to nature. Thanks for that. There the grown serpent lies, the worm that's fled hath nature that in time will venom breed no teeth for the present. Get thee gone. Tomorrow we'll hear ourselves again. <laughs> so... The conversation with the murderer does not go the way Macbeth wanted it to. He finds out that Fleance has escaped. And so he says, I would have been perfect. Everything would have been great. 
if they had both been killed. So he's already starting this feast feeling insecure again because Fleance has escaped. Notice this irony, safe in a ditch he bides. He is safely dead. And so now Macbeth returns to try to salvage the feast and to try to be jocund or joyous at the feast. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> My royal lord, you do not give the cheer. The feast is sold, it is not often vouched, while it is a making, it is given with welcome. To feed your best at home. From thence, the sauce to meet is ceremony. The meeting would bear without it. Sweet remembrance, sir. Now, good digestion, wait on appetite. A health on both. A health on, on both. both. May it please your highness sit. Here had we now our country's honour roofed were the grace person of our banquet present. Uh, may I rather challenge for unkindness than pity for mischance. His absence, sir, lays blame upon his promise. Please, your highness, to grace us with your royal Aye. Uh, the table's full. Here is a place reserved, sir. Where? Here, my good lord. What is moves, your highness? Which of you have done this? What, what my, my good lord? lord? My good lord. Canst not say I did it? Never shake thy gory locks at me. Gentlemen, rise. His highness is not well. Set, worthy friends. My lord is often thus and hath been from his youth. So pray you keep seat. <clears throat> Oh. The fit is momentary. Upon a thought, he will again be well. If much you note him, you shall offend him and extend his passion. Feed <laughs> and regard him not. <laughs> Are you a man? Aye, and a bold one that day look on that which might appall the devil. Oh, proper stuff. This is the very painting of your fear. This is the air-drawn dagger which you said led you to Duncan. Oh, these flaws and starts, imposters to true fear, would well become a woman's story at a winter's fire authorized by her granddam. Shame itself. Why do you make such beats as when all's done you look but on a stool? Ah, pretty she there. Behold, look low. Oh, how say you? Why, what can I? If thou canst not speak too, if charnel houses and our graves must send those that be buried back, our monuments shall be the moors of kites. What's quite unmanned in folly. If I stand here, I saw him. Fie for shame. Blood hath been shed ere now in the olden time, ere human statute purged the gentle wheel. Aye, and since two murders have been performed too terrible for the ear, the time has been that when the brains were out, the man would die and there an end. But now they rise again with twenty mortal murders on their crowns and push us from our stools. This is more strange than such a murder is. My worthy lord, your noble friends do lack you. So the feast is off to an interesting start. It all begins with Macbeth offering a toast. And the toast that he gives is quite ironic. First of all, he says, now we had our country's honor roofed, were the graced person of our banquo present. Who may I rather challenge for unkindness than pity for mischance? What he's saying there is, well, I really do hope that Banquo is just late and that nothing bad has happened to him. So what is ironic about that? Surely you just told the person sitting next to you that he is he knows something bad happened to Banquo and he's very glad something happened to Banquo. So first of all, we have verbal irony that he is saying the opposite of what he means. And we also kind of have dramatic irony because we, the audience know what he's talking about and the other characters don't. And then finally, we also have situational irony Because right after he says, I wish Banquo was here, the ghost of Banquo has entered and is sitting in Macbeth's chair. So he is there 
as a ghost. So we have all three ironies going on right here in that toast. You heard Macbeth's reaction to the ghost showing up. And everyone at the feast heard it too. All of his carrying on, the lords, the thanes there at the, feast are, at the feast are watching this happen. Lennox says, what are you looking at? The lords say, what do you see? What do you think we have done? They're, they're asking him these questions. While Macbeth freaks out and talks to the ghost, never shake thy gory locks at me. It has quite an effect on him. Lady Macbeth tries to cover for it as best she can. She says, oh, he's often been this way from his youth. Like, oh, this happens all the time. It's no big deal. Don't worry about it. But uh, don't, don't pay attention. Don't pay attention or you'll offend him. Everyone look away. Look away. To Macbeth. She begins to challenge his manhood again. She says, are you a man? And then she, later she says, you're quite unmanned in folly. She says, look, these flaws and starts are just impostures to true fear. You have nothing really to be afraid of. She says, these are the kinds of things. Look, you see a ghost, you see a dagger. These are just the kinds of things that an old grandmama would tell in a ghost story. So she's really belittling his fear and belittling this traumatic experience he's going through. He continues to go on about um, burial houses spitting out their dead. And he says, it used to be that you could kill a guy and that would be the end of it. But now they rise again to push us from our chairs. And so he's saying, right, if you remember back in Act 1 when he was saying, if this could be the be all and end all, he's saying, look, it's not. It's not all over when you kill somebody. Now they come back and haunt you. Lady Macbeth, after the ghost finally vanishes, notice, is able to settle him back down. And now he's going to try to recover the feast. I do forget. Do not muse at me, my most worthy friends. I have a strange infirmity which is nothing to those that know me. Come, love and health to all, then I'll sit down. <laughs> Give me some wine. <laughs> I drink to the general joy of the whole table <laughs> and to our dear friend Banquo, uh, whom we miss, would he were here. To all and him we thirst and all to all. Our, our duties, duties and, and the, the pledge. Our duties. Have armed and quit my sight, let the earth hide thee. Thy bones are marvelous, thy blood is cold, thou hast no speculation in those eyes, which thou dost glare with. Think of this, good peers, but as a thing of custom, tis no other, only it spoils the pleasure of the time. What man dare hide? Approach thou like the rugged Russian bear, the armed rhinoceros, or the hurricane tiger. Take any shape but that, and my firm nerve shall never tremble, or be alive again. And dare me to the desert with thy sword. If trembling I inhabit, then protest me the baby of a girl. Hence, horrible shadow, unreal mockery, hence. Oh, my soul. Being gone, I am a man again. Pray sit still. You have displaced the mirth, broke the good meeting with most admired disorder. Can such things be and overcome us like a summer's cloud without our special wonder? You make me strange, even to the disposition that I owe, when now I think you can behold such sights and keep the natural ruby of your cheeks when mine is blanched with fear. Oh, sight, my lord. I pray you speak not. He grows worse and worse. Questioning rages him. At once, good night. Stand not upon the order of your going, but go at once. Good night. Uh, better health attend his majesty. Uh, I, good night. A, a kind good night to all. So the feast didn't go that well. <laughs> they were not able to recover the feast. And instead, the lords are left with the impression that Macbeth is 
unstable. Notice that he again basically summons the ghost of Banquo with this toast to our dear friend Banquo whom we miss. All the same ironies are there. He ironically calls the ghost there. He doesn't really wish he was there and we know where he really is. He freaks out even more this time and sounds even more upset. He begins to holler, take any shape but that, and my nerves would never tremble. He himself, after the ghost vanishes, says, now I am a man again, questioning his own manhood at, through his fear. And then he turns and challenges Lady Macbeth and says, now I'm starting to wonder about you. How are you able to behold such sights and keep the natural ruby of your cheeks when mine are blanched with fear? First of all, this is, she can't see the ghost. She doesn't see what he's looking at. Earlier she said, you look but on a stool. And, but then hearing this, Ross says, what sights, my lord? And Lady Macbeth jumps up and says, I pray you speak not, question enrages him. At once, good night, stand not upon the order of your going, but go at once. So she's saying, you need to, everybody leave all at once. Don't worry about the social ranking. Just everybody all get up and leave without doing it like a ceremony. She calls it, she, she calls it all down, cl closes it all out when Ross asks a direct question to Macbeth. She jumps in before he can answer. She's worried he's gonna answer. She thinks Macbeth, at being as unstable as he is right now, will turn around and say, the ghost of Banquo is just sitting in my chair with his head all bloody because I paid people to murder him. She has no idea what's gonna come out of Macbeth's mouth, but she does not trust it. So now the feast was a disaster and they have all left, leaving Macbeth and Lady Macbeth to decide what to do next. It will have blood, they say. Blood will have blood. Stones have been known to move and trees to speak. Augurs and understood relations have, by maggot pies and chuffs and rooks, brought forth the secrets to man of blood. What is the night? Almost at odds with morning, which is which. How sayst thou that Macduff denies his person at our great bidding? Did you send to him, sir? I hear it by the way. But I will send. There's not a one of them, but in his house I keep a servant feed. I will tomorrow, and betimes I will to the weird sisters. More shall they speak, for now I am bent to know by the worst means, the worst. For mine own good, all causes shall give way. I am in blood, stepped in so far, that should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as go o'er. Strange things I have in head, at will to hand, which must be acted, ere they may be scanned. You lack the season of all natures. Sleep. Come, we'll to sleep. <laughs> My strange and self-abuse is the initiate fear that wants hard youth. We are yet but young indeed. Lots of important things down here. First of all, blood will have blood reminds us of a theme that we have discussed already, the theme of fate. And this recalls what he has said back in act one, where he was saying that we but teach bloody instructions, they will return to plague the inventor. Blood will have blood. And then he now turns his attention to Macduff. Now that he's taking care of Banquo, now he says, wait a minute, where was Macduff? So now he's got a new person to be concerned about. And 
so then he reveals that he's keeping servants paid. He's bribing people who work inside all of the Thane's houses. And he tells Lady Macbeth that he's going to go back to the Weird Sisters, that he is going to go find out by worst means the worst. He says, for mine own good, all causes shall give way. So he says, everything will bend to my will. This is much like what he said in uh, the monologue we looked at earlier, where he said, come fate into the list. He is willing to challenge fate. And he says, again, this image of blood, I am in blood stepped in so far that should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as to go o'er. So he says, I have stepped so far into this river of blood. I have gotten this way by so many violent means that I might as well just continue to be bloody. And he is resolved to continue through bloody means. He says, there's no sense and returning to the other side. There's no sense in going back to being a good loyal man. I might as well continue to be a violent one. And then he says, strange things I have in my head that will to my hand, which must be acted ere they may be scanned. Ere means before. And he says, so he's saying, I'm going to act before I think kind of the opposite of what people suggest you should do, right? People are always telling you to think before you act. Macbeth says, no, I need to act quickly. I need to act before I bother to think stuff over. Lady Macbeth replies, you need to get some sleep. And he agrees they need to get sleep, but he finishes the scene by saying, my strange and self-abuse is the initiate fear that wants hard use. We are yet but young indeed. So my strange and self-abuse, he's talking about seeing ghosts because he says this is just beginner's fear. It needs more experience. So he's saying because I need more experience with this kind of thing. We are yet but young indeed. Um, he's saying we're new at this, this being murder. He's saying we need more experience with murder and we'll get used to it. No big deal. We'll get used to it. And so that is how we leave Macbeth in act three. He is not in the rest of the scenes. So at the end of act three, halfway through the play, Macbeth is resolved to continue in bloody methods, to act before he thinks, and that he needs more experience with murder.